The Albigensian Crusade, 1209-1229 A twenty-year-long military campaign initiated by Pope Innocent III to eliminate the Cathar heresy in Languedoc, the south of France. But it wasn't just a religious conflict against the Cathars, but also a political manoeuvre to extend the influence of the French crown over the wealthy and semi-autonomous southern regions. Regardless, it was marked by its brutality and mass persecution of the Cathar believers, and this crusade drastically altered the region leading to a significant reduction in the Cathars and the consolidation of the French state. The Albigensian Crusade is remembered for a tragic loss of life, the suppression of religious diversity, and its role in the expansion of royal power. Hello, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, it's good to meet you. If you're coming back, good to see you again. As always, if you want to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description. Otherwise, liking the video and subscribing certainly helps push it out to a broader audience. Did you like it? Thank you. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Please, make yourself relaxed. First, let's talk about the Cathars. Originating from the Greek term... Catharos, for pure. The Cathars' beliefs were deeply influenced by the very early Gnostic thinkers, embodying a dualistic world view. They suggested the existence of two opposing transcendental forces, a benevolent god of spirituality and an evil demiurge, termed Rex Mundi, or in our tongue, the king of the world. Well, this was responsible for creating the flawed physical realm. For the Cathars, the divine was entirely spiritual, embodying love and peace. And Jesus was not seen as a man, but a spiritual being with his biblical depictions, meant rather allegorically. Now, Cathar ideology suggested that human beings were initially soulless, with souls either being a malevolent gift from the Demiurge, or a beneficial gift from God. This belief underpinned their stringent views against procreation and the material world viewing it as perpetuating the cycle of souls trapped in corrupt bodies. They denied the legitimacy of secular authority and abstained from military duties and oath-taking, aligning once again with their rejection of the material world's politics. Moreover, their ethical teachings included prohibitions against animal slaughter and meat consumption. The Cathar critique extended all the way to the Catholic Church, denouncing its priesthood as corrupt and asserting that any individual, regardless of who they were, could perform the sacred rites, challenging the traditional Catholic sacraments. They specifically developed the Consolamentum, a spiritual baptism through hand-laying, seen as a purification from sin, particularly administered to those who were near death, leading to the status of Perfectus. These Perfectus individuals adhered strictly to Cathar moral directives, including abstaining from sex and meat, with some undergoing the endura, a fast to death, to ensure their spiritual purity. This practice was contentious, with alleged, with allegations rather, 
of enforced euthanasia to secure heavenly admission. The community structure included bishops selected from the perfect, with stipulations on reapplications of consolamentum upon the commission of sin by either the recipient or the administering bishop, highlighting more of the rigidity and depth of the Cathar spiritual discipline. Can you see why the Catholic Church did not like them very much? Well, especially the whole refusing military service. Now that ought to annoy those in charge. So, Catharism found a fertile ground in the Languedoc, later known as Octania, a region characterized by its distinct cultural identity and linguistics, separate from the northern territories, recognizing themselves by this time as part of the United Kingdom of France. Unlike the north, where political unity under the French crown was more pronounced, the Languedoc was more of a patchwork of local lordships, and had a history of relative peace, before the onset of the crusade against the Cathars at least. Their dominant language, Octan, markedly different from the northern French dialects, aligning more closely with Catalan, is just another unique aspect of the region. Now the county of Toulouse, stood as a significant political force in Languedoc, owing fealty to the Angevin Empire, rather than to the French crown. Its influence was contested by the neighboring crown of Aragon and Principality of Catalonia, which exerted greater sway over the eastern territories adjacent to Toulouse. This political fragmentation was mirrored in the burgeoning power of towns throughout the region, with Toulouse emerging as the major urban centre, boasting considerable size, wealth, and autonomy by 1209. Now, the architecture of the Languedoc, characterised by fortified towns, or castra, underscored a societal inclination towards defence, contrasting with the rural expanses of northern France. This urbanisation facilitated a milieu of relative religious tolerance, where the Jews encountered comparatively minimal discrimination, and religious dissenters could find their refuge. Well, Muslims did not enjoy the same level of tolerance, but their intellectual contributions were nonetheless respected. Still a lot better than being in other parts of Europe. The sharp cultural and social dichotomy between the north and south territories of what is now France was very profound with mutual distrust and stereotypes colouring somewhat strange perceptions on both sides, as strange as they were ill-informed. Northerners viewed the Southerners as decadent and overly concerned with social proprieties, influenced negatively by what they consider lower professions and minority groups. On the other hand, the Southerners perceived the Northerners as uncouth and aggressive. This divide set the stage for what would eventually be a protracted and acrimonious conflict between the two regions, should war erupt. Yeah, of course it always does, doesn't it? Well, it wasn't a new idea. The Cathars were integral to a broader movement of spiritual reform across medieval Europe that traces its origins all the way back to around 653, when Constantine Silvanus introduced the Gospels to Armenia. Over the ensuing centuries, 
several dissenting factions emerged, rallying around dynamic preachers who challenged the Catholic Church's authority, advocating for a faith practice anchored in the Gospels and apostolic tradition, rather than simply church dogma. These groups, including the Paulicians, Bogomils, Arnoldists, Petrobrusians, Henricans, and the Waldensians, of course, faced severe persecutions, with responses ranging from expulsion all the way up to brutal executions. The call for individual spiritual responsibility in church reform was echoed by 12th century figures such as Henry of Lausanne, who criticized the priesthood without aligning with Cathar dualism, and Arnold of Brescia, who was executed for his beliefs. Now the Waldensians, followers of Peter Waldo, also suffered extreme persecution. While these groups shared the Cathars' anti-clerical stance and skepticism towards sacraments, only the Paulicians and Bogomils were noted for dualist beliefs that were similar to the Cathars. Now, scholars have debated the origins of the Cathars, with some proposing a direct link to the Bogomils within a broader Manichaean tradition. This connection was possibly strengthened by Latin settlers in Constantinople after the First Crusade, who may have facilitated the transfer of dualist Bogomil texts to the West, introducing the Consumalentum ritual and sparking the first organized dualist movements in Western Europe. By the 12th century, dissident groups like the Cathars and Waldensians became more visible in Europe's burgeoning urban centers. The Cathars, particularly in the highly urbanized western Mediterranean France, evolved into a mass movement, spreading into areas like Lombardy by the 1170s. The movement was partly a critique of the clergy's corruption and a manifestation of the discontent with papal authority, which there was plenty of, and if you haven't heard of it, just remember, some of the records at the time are written by the papacy themselves. Now, while the Cathars shared some views with the Waldensians, especially in their critique of the Catholic hierarchy and emphasis on austerity, they differed in a few of their theological positions, with Cathars being the ones to adapt a more radical stance. This divergence led to the Church directing its efforts more aggressively against the greater of two evils as they saw it, namely Catharism. The persecution of heretics intensified exemplified by the burning of Cathars in Cologne in 1163, marking a shift towards more frequent executions for heresy, a practice that previously just occurred sporadically, often more for political rather than religious reasons. And this is before the main crusade has started, by the way. The exchange between the older dualist communities in the Byzantine Empire and the newer ones in Western Europe further cemented these dualist beliefs in the West. Catharism's stronghold was, though, undoubtedly the Languedoc, where it flourished significantly more in England, France or Germany, where its presence was either minimal or short-lived. The Cathars, also known as the Albigensians, named after Albi, a city closely associated with them, faced charges of heresy by the church, notably at a council near Albi in 1176, and again during the Third Lateran Council 
of 1179. The remarkable success of the Cathar movement in the Languedoc has been attributed to various factors, with the alleged corruption and incompetence of the clergy frequently cited. The region's priests, particularly those in the rural areas, were often described as poorly educated and engaged in monetary and physical misconduct with many holding their positions through lay appointments. While such clerical inadequacies were reported across Europe, the Languedoc's episcopacy was notably more corrupt, exemplified by the Archbishop of Narbonne's neglect of his diocesan duties and financial exploitation, which led the Pope, Innocent III, suspending him and three of other bishops, which were reportedly his close buddies. Now, the inability of the church to address heresy effectively in Languedoc was partly due to the region's lack of political centralization and the papacy's prioritization of appointments in more politically strategic areas. Despite being a minority, the Cathars gained significant acceptance among local Catholics, with some even achieving positions within Toulouse's city council. The region's ambivalence towards popular religious movements, such as the Crusades, despite initial enthusiasm read by Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, suggests a prevailing laxity that permitted the growth of non-conformist beliefs without much substantial opposition. Well, upon his election in 1198, Pope Innocent III made it his priority to confront the Cathar heresy in Languedoc head on, where the Cathars were disrespecting the authority of both the French king and the local Catholic Church. At least, that's how the local French king and the Catholic Church heard about it. Now, their protection by influential nobles, motivated by desire for autonomy from the king, led some of these nobles to actually outwardly support Catharism, albeit without adhering to its rigorous ethical demands. Faced with this challenge, and unable to gain support from Philip II of France, who was very much preoccupied with conflicts elsewhere, Innocent III proposed a military crusade against the Cathars, promising the same spiritual benefits as those accorded to crusaders heading to the Holy Land. Raymond IV of Toulouse, Raymond VI, rather, of Toulouse, a significant regional power, actually showed quite a bit of sympathy toward the Cathars, and resistance to French royal authority. But of course, he stopped just a little bit short of adopting the Cathar beliefs. His refusal to cooperate with Innocent's delegates led to his excommunication in 1207, and a papal interdict was placed on his lands. That's right, do as we tell you, or you're out of the club. Well, Innocent III's subsequent efforts to reclaim the Cathars through diplomatic means and preaching, led by Cistercian monks under Pierre de Castelnau, saw a little bit of success, but significant opposition. And it culminated in Pierre de Castelnau's murder in 1208, allegedly by an associate of Raymond IV. This act, of course, escalated the conflict, with Innocent III declaring Raymond anathematized and absolving his subjects of loyalty to him. 
Raymond's eventual attempt at reconciliation with the church briefly lifted the excommunication, but his ultimate failure to meet the church's conditions led to his re-excommunication at the Council of Avignon in 1209. This set the stage for Innocent III to formally call for a crusade against the Albigensians, framing it as part of a broader effort to rid Europe of heresy, and of course strengthen its defenses against Muslim invasions, aligning this initiative with the ongoing Fifth and Sixth Crusades in the Holy Land. By 1209, approximately 10,000 crusaders had met in Lyon, preparing to head south into Languedoc. Their ranks, replenished every 40 days, included many from northern France and volunteers from England and Austria. Leadership of the crusade was uncertain after Philip II of France opted out due to emerging anti-French allies, yet promised troop support to maintain influence over the outcome. Papal legatee Arnord Amalric took command of the expedition. Efforts by Raymond VI of Toulouse to unify defences with his nephew, Raymond Roger Trensavel, failed leading him to negotiate with the Crusaders. Despite opposition from Amalric, Pope Innocent III's newly appointed legatee, Milo, was directed to follow Amalric's lead. Raymond's public repentance and acceptance back into the church shifted the Crusaders' focus to Raymond Roger's territories, known for their Cathar populations. Thusly, the Crusaders left Lyon on the 24th of June, reaching Montpellier by July 20th, with their sights set on areas around Albi and Carcassonne. Raymond Roger, while not a Cathar himself, was seen as a protector of the sect, guilty by association somewhat. Despite his attempts to assert loyalty to the church and disclaim responsibility for heresy due to his youth, the Crusaders rejected peace talks and advanced on Beziers, a city known for its large Cathar community. Raymond Roger's withdrawal to Carcassonne left Beziers extremely vulnerable. The Crusaders' assault on Beziers on July 21st resulted in the city's fall and massacre of its inhabitants, including both Cathars and Catholics. The reported command by Amalric to kill them all, God will know his own, whether accurate or not, reflects the ruthlessness of the attack, with claims of nearly 20,000 casualties. The aftermath saw many settlements surrendering or evacuating without resistance as the Crusaders advanced unopposed to Carcassonne. Don't know if you can hear, but it's raining rather heavily outside. I love days like this. Anyway, Following the devastating massacre at Beziers, Carcassonne became the Crusaders' subsequent major objective. Despite its strong fortifications, the city was at a disadvantage, as it was overwhelmed by refugees seeking sanctuary. The Crusaders covered the distance from Beziers to Carcassonne in six days initiating the siege on August the 1st, 1209. The siege swiftly intensified as the Crusaders severed the city's water supply by August the 7th, and in a bid for peace, Raymond Roger Trenceval, the Viscount of Carcassonne, entered negotiations, but 
was captured under the flag of a truce. The city, on August 15th, capitulated, and while its inhabitants were spared death, they were expelled, made to leave with minimal clothing, as described by differing accounts from Peter of Vaudecernay and Guillaume de Pellurens. Now, Raymond Roger's subsequent death in captivity, officially attributed to dysentery, sparked more than a few suspicions of foul play. I mean, it seems a bit dodgy, don't you think? In the aftermath of this, the leadership of the Crusader forces was conferred upon Simon de Montfort, a decision that also saw him gain control over territories including Carcassonne, Albi, and Beziers. The capitulation of Carcassonne led to a series of unopposed surrenders across the region, with Albi, Castelnaudry, Castres, Fanjou, Limoux, Lombers, and Montreal, all falling to the Crusaders by autumn. The conflict then shifted to Lastors and Cabaret, with an unsuccessful attack on the latter in December 1209 by the Crusaders. The harsh winter conditions and limited troop numbers led Simon de Montfort to focus on consolidating his gains rather than launching new offences. With the arrival of reinforcements, Bram fell to the Crusaders in the March of 1210, followed by the siege of Minerve in June. Despite its lack of strategic significance, Minerve was targeted due to the presence of numerous Khazar prefects. Perfects, rather. After a prolonged siege, that culminated in the destruction of the city's main water supply, Minerve surrendered on the 22nd of July. While Simon favoured leniency, Arnold Amalric insisted on harsh treatment for the Cathar perfects, leading to the execution of them, who refused to renounce their faith. All 140 of them brought out into the public, and dealt with harshly, in a show of force, made an example of, it seems. The crusade continued to Termes in August, enduring despite interventions from Pierre Roger de Cabaret. The defender's situation became dire due to water shortages but they were momentarily relieved by a rainstorm, delaying their surrender. Ultimately, the defenders escaped on November the 22nd. By 1211, dissatisfaction with the Crusaders' tactics had alienated many of the key lords, including Raymond of Toulouse. Lastors capitulated in March, and the siege of Lavar began in April. Crusader reinforcements were then decimated in an ambush at Monguet by forces from Toulouse led by the Count of Foix. Following the recapture of Amory de Montreal's castle, numerous Cathars faced execution. The Crusaders' campaign proceeded with the fall of Cassés and the siege of Montferrand, leading Baldwin to defect to the Crusaders. Efforts to besiege Toulouse faltered due to logistical challenges, prompting de Montfort's withdrawal. Raymond de Toulouse's counterattack at Castelnaudry saw the Crusaders narrowly averting defeat. Throughout early 1212, Simon de Montfort effectively isolated Toulouse, undermining Raymond's support and resources. 
now seeking to counter the Crusaders. The Cathars enlisted the help of Peter II of Aragon, who, after notable victories against the Moors and an alliance through marriage to Raymond VI, possessed considerable influence. Utilizing his victories and diplomatic efforts in Rome, Peter persuaded Pope Innocent III to attempt halting the Albigensian Crusade. Motivated by the Pope's desire to focus on the Middle East and ongoing conflicts with the Moors. By January of 1213, Innocent III had called for peace in the Languedoc, instructing Arnold Omery and Simon de Montfort to cease their aggressive campaigns, and proposing a council to reconcile differences under Peter's guidance. Hold on a moment. Wasn't this your idea in the first place, Mr. Pope Innocent III? Well, either way, the cat was out of the bag now, wasn't it? Who would have thought that initiating the Holy War would have become so violent? Well, despite Peter's efforts at the Council of Lavar to secure a peaceful resolution and restore the lands to Raymond VI, his propositions were dismissed, maintaining the excommunication of Raymond and the seizure of lands that were deemed heretical. Peter's rejection of this decision, and concern over Simon de Montfort's growing power, led him to support Toulouse actively. This alliance alarmed Innocent III, who, misled by Simon's delegation, denounced Peter, and called for the renewal of the crusade against him. The conflict culminated in the Battle of Muret in the September of 1213, where, despite numerical disadvantages, Simon's tactical maneuvers led to Peter II's death and a retreat of the coalition forces. This defeat severely weakened the resistance against the Crusaders, forcing Raymond VI and his son to flee all the way back to England, where they found limited support from King John, who was cautious of the Crusades' implications. The Crusaders' momentum continued through 1214, with significant victories and territorial gains, including strategic castles in Perigord. By 1215, with the capture of Toulouse and its subsequent handover to Simon de Montfort, recognized officially by the Fourth Council of the Lateran, Crusader control was all but solidified. The Council's decisions not only cemented Simon's authority over conquered lands, but also aimed to secure the Church's influence over yet unconquered territories. Amidst all of this, the call for a new crusade in the Middle East by Innocent III redirected potential reinforcements from the Albigensian Crusade, leading Simon to increasingly depend on mercenaries to maintain some form of control. In the April of 1216, Raymond VI and his son Raymond VII rallied a considerable force from towns who were disillusioned with the Crusaders, and by May they had laid siege to Beaucaré, successfully negotiating its surrender after three months due to their dwindling supplies. Despite efforts by Montfort to intervene, he was repelled. Pope Innocent III's death in July of 1216 left the crusade somewhat directionless, with leadership passing to a more hesitant Philip II of France, who was preoccupied with conflicts elsewhere. Montfort then quelled a rebellion in Toulouse, before attempting to recapture Bigorre, 
facing defeat at Lourdes in December of 1216. And Raymond the Sixth, recaptured Toulouse in the September of 1217, exploiting Montfort's engagement in Foix. Now despite Montfort's return, he couldn't retake the city, and operations ground to a halt, at least for a little while. In 1218, at Pope Honorius III's urging, Montfort resumed the siege of Toulouse. But in June, Montfort died from a stone that was thrown from the city's defences, marking a significant setback for the Crusaders. But what a throw! Honorius III's subsequent call for renewed action failed to regain momentum, with Prince Louis's 1219 campaign to retake Jerusalem faltering after a mere six weeks. Now Raymond VI and Raymond VII regained significant territories by 1222, with the sixth passing and the seventh succeeding him. Philip II's death in 1223 saw Louis VIII inherit the throne, leading a large force against the Cathars in 1226, capturing key towns with minimal resistance. Avignon's siege ended in September after agreeing to pay a fine and dismantle its defences. Louis VIII died in 1226, and it led to a continuation of the crusade under the Queen Regent Blanche of Castile and Humbert the Fourth of Beaujau, capturing more territories. And by 1228 a besieged Toulouse succumbed to the crusaders' systematic devastation of the surrounding area. The Treaty of Paris in 1229 ended Raymond VII's resistance, recognizing his rule over Toulouse in exchange for concessions to the crown and a marital alliance with Alphonse of Poitiers, ensuring the region's return to royal control upon Raymond's death. Following the conclusion to the military campaigns against the Cathars, the Inquisition was initiated by Pope Gregory IX in 1234 to eradicate heretical movements, including the remnants of Catharism from the Languedoc region. Operating throughout Toulouse, Albi, Carcassonne, and other towns into the 14th century, the Inquisition effectively suppressed Catharism as a widespread movement, pushing its adherents into secrecy. Punishments for those identified as Cathars ranged from wearing yellow crosses for penance to imprisonment and the forfeiture of property, with the most unrepentant being executed by burning. Nonetheless, this was very, very rare, and the majority simply faced lesser penalties. Dominican friars were pivotal in the Inquisition's efforts, preaching Orthodox Church doctrines and participating in the identification and prosecution of Cathars. But despite all these measures, Catharism persisted in some areas, largely out in the countryside where no one really likes to look. Now Raymond the Seventh of Toulouse, allied now with England's King Henry the Third, mounted a failed revolt against French authority between 1242 and 43, which included the assassination of two inquisitors. The subsequent siege of Montsegur from 1243 to 44 culminated in the execution of over 200 Cathar perfects in the March of 1244, a direct response to the earlier killings of inquisitors. And it was this event that marked a significant blow to the Cathar community, 
though notably, it did not extinguish the practice entirely. The Inquisition's relentless pursuit of Cathars continued, employing various methods including torture to extract confessions. Though capturing only a fraction of those practicing in secret. Following Raymond's death in 1249 and Alfonso's in 1271, the county of Toulouse was absorbed into the French kingdom, with the Inquisition thereafter benefiting from French royal support. King Philip IV curtailed his support in the 1290s among his dispute with Pope Boniface VIII, but reversed these limitations some thirteen years later in 1303, after witnessing anti-monarchical attitudes in southern France, particularly in Carcassonne, thus revitalizing the Inquisition's efforts. Now, Pope Clement V later implemented reforms to safeguard the accused rights. Bernard Guay, serving as the Inquisitor of Toulouse from 1308 to 1323, composed a manual outlining the practices of various non-Catholic groups, including detailed descriptions of Cathar customs, and provided guidance for inquisitors on handling heresy allegations. His policies included the posthumous condemnation of unrepentant heretics, either by burning their exhumed remains or simply unearthing them based on their confessional status at death. Under Gray's tenure, a concerted effort to eradicate the remnants of Catharism was launched, successfully eliminating the movement, at least on paper, by 1350. Well, the Albigensian Crusade, characterized by its brutality, diverged quite significantly from Pope Innocent III's envisioned reforms, which rather emphasized confession, clerical and lay reform, and pastoral teachings as a means to counteract heresy. The escalation of violence was largely attributed to the crusade being commandeered by unruly mobs, minor rulers and local bishops, all of whom deviated from innocence principles. The rampant, indiscriminate violence perpetrated by these groups and the secular courts against the alleged heretics prompted the papacy to seek enhanced control over heresy prosecutions, leading to the establishment of a more formalized legal process for handling such cases, which of course wasn't perfect, but baby steps first. The immediate aftermath of the Albigensian Crusade saw a diminished number of French participants in the subsequent Fifth and Sixth Crusades. The cultural impact of the Albigensian Crusade is clearly evident in the surviving works of troubadour poet-composers, many of whom were also knights. Notable examples include Raymond de Miravel, who appealed through his songs for Peter II's assistance in reclaiming his castles seized by Simon de Montfort, and the collaboration between Tomier and Paleazzi, whom criticized Raymond the Zick's treatment and encouraged resistance. The crusade and its fallout marked the beginning of the decline of the troubadour tradition, once flourishing under the patronage of Occitan courts. They faced decline as these courts were simply destroyed. Consequently, many troubadours migrated from southern France to royal courts across Italy, Spain and Hungary, seeking new patrons and audiences for their art. But their story is one for another video. And with that we reach the end of the history of the Albigensian Crusade. 
Was it all that you expected? Certainly interesting. I'd like to thank my mega chat dear patrons, JC, Jeffrey, and Stark Factory. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you'd like to support the channel, you know what to do. Follow the links in the description. And I will see you in the next video. Thanks again for joining me. Good night.